see the promise of forgiveness of our sin through your son's sacrifice. Assurance enough that those of us who have you made sons and daughters can sing with confidence that it is well with our souls. Help those of us who know you as Father to never take that for granted. And help those who have not yet had the life-changing encounter with you, help them on their journey toward that glorious end. Father, now, please continue to be revealed through our pastor as he brings the truth of the gospel to us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Terra Nova. Please have a seat. My name is Ed Marsalvin. I serve a great team of pastors here as the lead pastor. Uh, we were scheduled in our missionary series to hear a sermon on Amy Carmichael from Bill Cuthbertson. Cuthbertson's had some unexpected stuff come up in their world. You can be praying for them and not able to make it, so uh, we went to the bullpen. I'll see what I can do today for us. Uh, what I want us to be able to talk about is this entire series of being missionaries and the heart of the Father and how it changes us. Our heart becomes more in sync with the Father's heart. It will make a difference in us as our heart becomes more like His. There are three realms that every Christian has to live out of to grow. And we have to be careful that they have a balance or it can become toxic. If you just have a third of the gospel, you, you, you don't have just a fraction. You actually end up having zero. You have to have all these things in balance. There's a realm in which we're mystics. Not in the sense that someone burns toast and we see the face of Jesus in it. I mean mystics in the sense of we follow an invisible God. That we look towards him. We seek to know him more deeply. It's not enough just to know about him. A theologian will do that. But a mystic has to know and experience their God. We also grow as pilgrims. From knowing God and knowing about God, we have to live out our own walk. And we all have a story that God is writing in Christ. And he displays something of his son through our stories and then collectively as the church. So we all walk this pilgrimage. And the difference between a pilgrim and a hermit, hermits do it alone. Pilgrims travel together. That's where the church comes in, that we can never buy into this very cultural idea that everything we have is private and on our own, and religion is one of the most private things. The gospel calls us to a radical community of saints, of pilgrims together, mystics and pilgrims and also missionaries. See, if we become men and women who know and love our God, see him changing us and become rightfully grateful for the changes that are happening in us, but never really seek to extend that to anyone else, we've become sort of selfish with the gospel in a very non-Christian way. We've become anti-missionaries. We're no longer reaching out. To say it another way, there is an eternal realm in which the Christian lives, where he seeks the God who is eternal, and that will always continue. You can press into God as much as you can in this world, and there will always be more of him to know. We live in an internal realm, that place where we recognize our own story and the story of our church is being shaped by God, and in an external field where we have to be able to say, the, the world around me, souls that God has made in the image of God matter enough where if I receive this gospel, I have the happy obligation of becoming a messenger of this same gospel. The goal of this series is really threefold. It's partly to inform us. Through the stories of these missionaries, we'll see glimpses of the world that they knew and where those countries are today. It's partly to inspire us. These men and women, many of them led heroic lives. They're the kind of lives that should challenge us to think an individual plus their God can accomplish this. It can be a shoemaker who wins India. It, it can be the simple daughter of a family whose fortune is broken that will serve her whole life as a missionary. They, they should inform and inspire us, but ultimately, if inspiration does its job, they have to activate us. We have to become men and women who figure out how, how do we actually care about and serve the world around us. There are a few things worth repeating whenever we hit these moments on missions. One is to remember always, this is the mission of God. It's not something we're trying to create to satisfy ourselves. While it may leave you feeling good to serve others, the goal isn't just your own feeling of self-satisfaction. This is the mission of Christ who came to seek and save the lost. Some other things worth repeating about missions whenever we hit it. The call to mission is both global and local. 
So many times when we hear these inspirational stories of missionaries who at the cusp of the Western missionary movement went to places that were largely unreached into China and India and Burma, we can think that we, we need to get all the shots and a passport to be a missionary. But the reality is we gather to celebrate Jesus in a county that is 1% evangelical Christian. You, you don't need a passport. You just need a heart in sync with God and one life willing to serve Jesus, your Savior. I think that idea is worth repeating. And just like it's local and global, missions is also not just something in the past, but something of this era. Now, we may hear about these people and think, okay, the way they did it was very different in the world they lived in, and the technological backdrop that defined that world. It's one of those old kind of limericky poems, but it's, while it's a little corny, it's always helped me to remember things about the difference between methods and principles and how, how methods will shift from era to era. The poem says, methods are many, principles are few. Methods always change, principles never do. We can look at these men and women and see the core of how they lived and why they lived in the gospel and see that that matters for us today. We can look at the methods and say that really wouldn't work today, and that's fine. We can't get sentimental about methods as the church, whether locally or globally. So here's what I want us to do today. I'm going to read a portion of scripture from Acts chapter 28, the last passage of the book of Acts. If you, if you need a Bible, please put your hand up uh, to get one. And uh, after that, what I'm going to do is share a little bit about Europe and particularly Italy, where it's gone and where it is today, through the stories of two great pre-Reformation heroes in Italy and two current churches um, that are part of the same movement that, that we're in and have shared with in the past. So if you have your Bible, turn to Acts chapter 28. I'll be picking up at the passage which begins at uh, verse 11 and reading through 31. After three months... We set sail in a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead, putting in at Syracuse. We stayed there for three days. And from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up. On the second day, we came to Putioli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. After three days, he called together the local leaders of the Jews, and when they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. When they had examined me, they wished to set me at liberty because there was no reason for the death penalty in my case, but because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, though I had no charge to bring against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. And they said to him, We have received no letters from Judea about you, and none of the brothers coming here has reported or spoken any evil about you, but we desire to hear from you what your views are, for with regard to this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at this lodging in great numbers from morning till evening. He expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets. And some were convinced by what he said, but others disbelieved. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for what you have provided for us. We are men and women who are so often blind and once were locked only in darkness and didn't even know light. 
And then, Lord, you reveal two things critical for us. You show us who we are, Lord, in our sinfulness, in our animosity towards you. You reveal to us that we're not the heroes of the story, Lord. We're, we're the rebels. We're the villains. But, Lord, you also reveal your son, Jesus, who would take on flesh to take on the sins of all who rebelled against you and would offer a salvation free and full and complete in him. And, Lord, we want to receive that as children open-handed and trusting. And we want to be able to walk away from that and in that as men and women who are strong in you and serve well in our day. We ask these things not for our name's sake or our betterment, but for Jesus and his glory and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Paul is on his last missionary journey. It's the fourth trip. It's the one that will end in Italy after bringing the gospel to Central Asia and to Eastern Europe. He'll, he'll now head to Rome itself, to the center of power and politics and commerce of his day. And he finds himself brought there in chains. And, and he speaks to people from the Bible. When he brings the Jewish leaders together, he speaks to them out of the prophet Isaiah, who himself was sent as a missionary in that passage. He's brought into this incredible vision of the throne room of God, and there he realizes who he is in the scene. As the angels cry, holy, holy is the Lord, he realizes his own unholiness and says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And God has an angel take a coal from the offering and, and touches his lips and says, you're, you're cleansed. God actually wants that for us. He doesn't want the distance between us. He, he wants us to know we can be cleansed in him. But then he asks the cleansed Isaiah, sober thinking now, who will I send and who will go for me? And Isaiah answers, here I am, send me. And then he's told, go, but there are going to be people who don't listen, people who don't see what you're saying. And it's the process that all missionaries must experience. They have to first know the love of God that's set upon them and to know the change that that brings, the freedom that that gives. To know this purifying love compels us to carry that message. But we also have to know it may not always be well received. No one promised that it's easy work to follow after Jesus. So simply look at our Lord and his life in carrying this message and ask yourself, if we're followers of his, where did we get the idea that ease and comfort and instant success should be ours in this world when it was not his. Paul uses up his own life. He's imprisoned wrongly. He's spending his own money to stay there for two years so that he can be available to these people to speak to them day and night about the gospel, about the Lord. His own presence welcoming them. I mean, after all, at the end of the day, people are not looking for us to share data about Jesus with them. They're actually looking deeply to us to share something of a life that says it's different in the kingdom of God. It's different knowing him. And we share ourselves in this mix. And the gospel received a diversity of reactions, acceptance and rejection. It's not unlike Jesus' parable about sowing seed, that some of it produces and some of it falls in a place that just isn't ready. It's not unlike Paul when he was in Athens in Mars Hill and he stopped visiting the synagogues and went out into the streets and was brought to Mars Hill and argued with the philosophers and presented Jesus. And it said, some received and some mocked and some wanted to hear more. Uh, the English graffiti artist Banksy said, when it comes to my work, I, th I think people either really love it, hate it, or don't really care. And I, I think that's sort of true for the gospel, that people either seem to really love it or hate it or don't really care. But, but expect those reactions. It's what Jesus taught. It's what Paul experienced. And missionaries go forward with that. Paul is just a couple of years away from massive persecution of Christians under Nero. And he came to Rome wanting to bring the gospel where people hadn't brought it before, but rejoices when he finds that God already has people there. Who they are, we don't know. They, they could have been faithful Jews who'd gone to Jerusalem on pilgrimage to Pentecost and came to know Jesus under Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 2 and then returned home. But for whatever reason, God had these workers already there. He had people who were embedded there. And Paul rejoiced over that. It'd only be a few centuries more after Nero that Diocletian would come and 
state persecution would become even more intense. And then a short time after the darkest piece of persecution in Italy's history, it would become the state religion. Now, you might think that's of great relief, but the reality is, whenever Christianity has become a state religion, it seems to really hurt the church. Because at some point, we start to confuse citizenry with a nation with the holiness of God. It happened in, in Rome, it happened in the UK, it's happened in the US, where when people think we're entitled by birth to Christianity, the church begins to grow weak. It loses its passion for the Lord. Europe now is very different from the Christian historical Europe that we might think of. The continent itself is about 4% evangelical. Now, let's try to define that term, what we mean when we say evangelical. What, what I mean is those who would believe the orthodox pieces of Christianity that make everybody Christian. See, before we even determine what brand of Christianity, what rules we have in our churches, how we celebrate that and how often, there's something that makes every believer a Christian. They're put out well in documents in the early 20th century, like the fundamentals of the faith that two Presbyterian brothers paid to have printed when they realized modernism was devouring the historical truths of Christianity. And here are the five things they listed as critical. I think it's a good list. The first, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ that this one who created all and ruled over all, who died for all. This is the Lord. He's not simply a man or a good teacher or a good prophet. That he was born of a virgin, that miraculously fulfilling the promise to Adam and Eve after the fall in Genesis, there would be one who was born only of woman. Three, that there was blood atonement for sin. Sin was not just a concept that Jesus was trying to teach us out of. Otherwise, God would be a negligent and abusive father. Sin was a penalty, an action that needed to be penalized that Jesus died for and paid for in his blood. The bodily resurrection of Jesus, number four. And five, the inerrancy of the scriptures themselves because that book that Paul preached from to display Jesus, that Jesus said was about him, when that's challenged, the rest seems to fall. It has to rest on that firm foundation, but always has to be used to point to Jesus or we can end up being men and women who just find a new and holy idolatry. We love the Bible instead of loving Jesus about whom the Bible speaks. So given those definitions, Europe's about 4% evangelical. To put that in global perspective, Asia's about 6%. North America, our home, about 13%. South America, 27% and Africa 25%. See, the, the world has shifted from Western Europe and North America being sort of the, the central location of strong Christianity to Africa and South America being the future of Christianity. When we think of Italy, you might think of historical Christianity. You may visit the places where, where Paul and Peter were imprisoned, um, but amid the ruins of one's vibrant art and music that celebrated Jesus, the gospel is now quiet as the catacombs in which the dead saints reside. One professor at Milan wrote this. He said, a survey conducted by Professor Paolo Sagatti of the University of Milan, published in the magazine Il Regno in May, found that news is even worse among younger Italians. Among those born after 1981, Sagatti found mass attendance, self-identification as Catholic or Christian, and adherence to teaching are in total collapse. He predicted a near future in which Catholicism, the majority religion historically in Italy, would have a minority status. It's imaginable that when the children of the younger generation become parents, they will make further contribution to secularization. Sagatti writes, the youngest Italians are the one to whom religious experience is most foreign. They clearly go to church less, believe in God less, pray less, trust the church or the Bible less, and identify themselves as Christians less and say that being Italian does not mean being religious. See, there is a gap that's common between Italy, Europe, and the United States, where a post-Christian generation raised a group who no longer saw the value of church, and now they enter into a, a dark place of nothingness. Italy doesn't have the history that we have or the rest of Europe has. Protestantism isn't really understood because the Reformation never took root there. Christianity, as we would know it, is seen largely by the Italians as a religion for foreigners. 
There's a, there's a massive flow of refugees from South America, North Africa, and the East who are coming in, many of whom are devout believers that we would recognize as Christians. And it's only helpful for the Italians to say, see, that those people, the foreigners, the outsiders, they believe like that. They learn the Bible like that. We, we don't. As a result, you get strange questions, right? I had someone in Italy ask me with some confusion, so are you Baptist or Protestant? Hmm. Someone else asked me, so you guys believe in God, but not Jesus, right? And then someone thirdly asked, so are you guys the same as Jehovah's Witnesses? Boy, there are moments where you just have to like be patient, think, translate, and then speak. Uh, I, I managed to play back into it when my Italian relatives were feeding me way too much food after some of the questions that they had. And this is, you know, it's the ridiculous stereotype meals that you have where the second thing that came out, my wife thought that was the entree, we were still in antipast phase. There was still pasta coming and meat coming and then fruit coming, and all of it is grown by my uncle and aunt, so you have to eat it all. And they got to the fruit and cheese plate, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's against my religion. And my cousins all laughed. My uncle looked very concerned and frightened and pulled it away. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm only joking. We can, we can eat fruit. Only, only one fruit was ever forbidden, forbidden in our faith, and someone ate that too. So <laughs> the, the Reformation, though, missed Italy. They, they, they don't have the legacy of Luther and Calvin. They, they don't have the historic library of Spurgeon or Whitfield or Wesley. They don't have the history of seminaries and preachers who would bring the gospel out. But there were moments before the rest of Europe's Reformation where, where the yeast that would ferment the Reformation was first happening in northern Italy. First, there was a group called the Waldensians. They came out of France. So there was a guy there named Waldo of Lyon. And Waldo recognized a few things about Christianity. He said, the Bible doesn't really seem to square with what I see. The poor seem largely ignored. The rich seem to be incredibly opulent, including those who are church people. And this needs to change. So he started calling people to follow after that kind of Christianity after living it on himself. He was a successful businessman who sold all of his wealth to be able to travel preaching and serving the poor. And other people began to follow him. There was something of the aroma of Christ, something so undeniably attractive to this sacrificial living where they weren't acquiring more. No one was going to have the, the keys to winning in this lifetime of having more wealth and more power. But there was something undeniably pure in what was going on there. Here are some of the doctrines the Waldensians believed. The church of God can be corrupted and has to be reformed. The Holy Scriptures alone are sufficient to guide people to salvation. The blessings and consecrations practiced in the church do not confer any particular holiness upon the things or items blessed. Everyone has the right to learn the word. Purgatory is an invention of the 6th century and not biblical. The indulgences of the church given to the saints or an invention of people seeking to make money. There's no obligation to keep holy days, Sunday accepted. The invocation of saints can't be admitted or found in the Bible. Every honor given to the church, to the holy images of paintings, to the relics of the saints is to be abolished. It was the germ of the Reformation in the 11 and 1200s. But in the north, you were very near the central power still of Rome and the Vatican. And fairly quickly, they were crushed as heretics and pushed out. They'd, they'd survive for a while because they were in the Italian Alps, and it was just hard to get to them. And you tended to leave the Hilltown boys alone, the hills have eyes and all that stuff. They just let them believe their thing, keep them isolated. And eventually they snuck over into Switzerland and would be protected by Calvin and sort of merge into the Reformed Church. But there it was for a brief time in Italy, a glimmer that would lift people out of idolatry and superstition and the control of the church. But it was set aside. Later, there would be one man who Luther would read and quote and seem to draw from greatly, who was also an Italian. His name was Savonarola. Savonarola was a Dominican monk who was in Florence in the late 1400s, and he was disillusioned by the church as well. He saw corruption and power. He saw the wealthy families of his city, the Medicis, as being the same people who were ruling the Vatican. And he began to preach against the abuse of the poor and the vanities of collecting more and more things for yourself and how it would harden the heart. And so many people were buying into this that they, they were coming to him repenting, saying, how do we get rid of these burdens from us? How do we get rid of our wealth? And, and people would create great piles of 
furniture and art and clothing and light them on fire in Florence in these days. And they were called the, the bonfires of vanity. They were burning the things that were just vain and passing and passing in an effort to free themselves. And Savonarola would preach that, that grace didn't come through, through steps in the church and following the blessings of priests, that it came from all that Jesus had given on the cross and that people could know that they were whole in him. Eventually, though, Savonarola ran into the same problem the Voldendians, Voldendians did. They were, they were too close to the central power, and they had no protector. See, Luther would have a prince who would look out for him. Savonarola only set those who were wealthy apart from him, and they decided they would kill Savonarola and two of his fellow priests. They hung them over fires so that their bodies would be burned, and no one would try to follow their bones or ashes as relics. They made sure they scattered them far and near. And the Reformation in Europe was radio silent in Italy when it was taking off all over the north. Which makes it understandable when you flash ahead to Diane and I sitting in Marco Polo Airport, eating, by the way, the most amazing food at airports. I mean, it was like grilled vegetables, red or white wine. It was so civil. It wasn't like an Arby's. It was incredible. There's something, there's something for, for all the vanity of Italy's beauty, there's something really nice when you're traveling to do that. Uh, and the tables were sort of full, which means in America you don't sit with other people. You just have to not sit. But in Europe, you can go find a table where there's still two seats there and sit down. So we, we sat with this older woman who was turned out was French and had lived in Italy for a couple of decades now, having married an Italian man. And she was telling us about her husband who had passed. And she was telling us about her marriage and what a good marriage looked like. And she found out what I did for a living and actually understood, didn't ask any questions that seemed out of sort to, to ask a guy who was a pastor. She understood what that was. And then eventually she asked me one question that sprung the whole conversation open into something deeper. She looked at me and said, do, do you think, do you believe there's something after all of this? She said, if there isn't, it doesn't make any sense. Why would we work so hard? Why my husband and I have this marriage? There was nothing after. And I explained to her that once upon a time, there was one thing that Englishmen, Frenchmen, Germans, and Italians and Spaniards agreed on. They knew that Jesus had come in the flesh, had died for sins, had rose from the dead, and promised to return for his people. So when she asked me if I believed this, I said, I have to believe that. I have to believe that this Jesus who rose from the dead will call us to life. But the statistics aren't hopeful in Europe of people hearing this. Questions and conversations like that aren't surprising. In Germany, the home of Luther and the Reformation, about 1% to 3% of the people would identify as evangelical. Less than one in Italy, less than one in Spain, less than one in France. So what are we supposed to do? Well, if we're all going to be involved, we have to recognize some level of calling and gifting that God has given us. There's probably a passion that you have in your heart that would serve well others who are going. For some of you, it may be that you go. For some of you, it may be that you give. For all of you, I hope it's that you're praying. For some of you, it's going to be here locally, figuring out how do I serve and give from our small group to our city. We all have these gifts differing that help us to grow into the church. Shifting to the church. There were two churches that we connected with in Italy while we were there. Uh, while it was our 25th anniversary, uh, I was really not sorry at all that we said to the churches, if I can serve while I'm there, if I can serve while she's there, we want to do that. It, it really felt like home. And I was able to carefully memorize the sentence in Italian, when I'm with the church, I'm with my family, and I feel at home. And you know, it's, it's Italy, so half the room cries and half the room fakes soccer injury. But they, they did what they did in response to that. The first church was in Serenissima, which is outside of Florence in the north. And there are really two Italys, make no mistake about it. I can remember my grandfather saying to me growing up, now, Edward, those Italians in the north, they're not real Italians. They're, they're Swiss and French and Austrians who came across the border. And I just, I just ignored it as like old-timey bigotries and just kind of let that go. But, but it, it's sort of true that these are very different Italys with very different economic backgrounds. All the wealth is in the north. Um, all the industries in the north. A good chunk of the population is in the north. And, and it is that place that's been influenced throughout treaties by Switzerland and Austria and other places. Uh, up there in the north in Serenissima, Rob Krauss has been there for about a decade. Rob's an American missionary with his wife and family, started this church. Now, this church was so surprisingly unique, 
in that it was the most international church I'd ever been in. The way refugees are showing up, Italy is now a portal for the entire world. Chileans, Ghanaians, um, there were people from Nigeria, there were people from Kenya, there were people from Romania. It w when he got up, the person who was doing the intro of the service said, how many of you speak Italian here today? It was less than a third of the church. A good number were Americans from a nearby Air Force base. And in this international church, there was this presence that had become grace and truth to all these people who were there. We met with two families for a day each who were key leaders there. Danny and Xenia are from Romania. They come from a very conservative church background uh, where men and women sit separately in the church. The service goes on for like three hours. So if I go over today, deal. It's like not even close to what they have to deal with. And, and, and they have all the rules that you might associate with fundamentalism and legalism here in the United States, which was great because I could dust off old jokes that they, they've never heard before. And I could, I could try to pass them off as my own. Um, so, so let's see how they, they work there compared to here. The, the first was, why do you always take two Baptists camping with you? Because if you only take one, he's going to drink all your beer. They appreciated that one. It's true, he started saying to me. Yeah, I'm, I, I, these, they're funny because they're true. Uh, the other was, why, why are Baptists so opposed to premarital sex? Because it might lead to dancing. So that's... <laughs> that one took translation twice. At first they thought, that's not funny. And then they got it. Oh, yeah, that is funny. <laughs> they come from Romania and have felt the freedom of the gospel in this church. They've also realized... He wants to be a pastor. His heart, inescapably, is to reach out to his neighbors on this playground that's like a UN. Everyone's there from these different countries, and they're just loving on these parents with their kids as their own children play there. But he's also realized he has to be bivocational. P part of it's practical. There, there's not a lot of money to pay pastors there, but part of it he sees as necessary for the culture. That pastors, because they don't have a sense of who these Protestant pastors are, are seen as worthless if they don't have a job. They're seen as guys who are freeloading, working only on Sunday, and living off the tax system, which in Italy is really high, that they're not paying into. So he's trying to figure out how he can be bivocational, be a dad, be a husband, continue to serve the church, and be trained for the pastorate, where there are very few materials translated into Italian. The other couple, Franco and Priscilla, he, he's from Italy, and she's from Paris via Chile. They also are looking to be bivocational and serve in ministry. But his heart for ministry is not so much evangelism and discipleship. It's running places outside the church, coffee shops and galleries, where people can, can be among the Christians in a place that isn't as intimidating or different and distinct as the church. In Salerno in the south, we visited the church that we went to as a group with, uh, with Terra Nova people last year. Justin and his wife, Abby Valiquette, started that church. When we were there a year, just one summer ago, we were trying to help them get a foothold and established by serving children there. They, they were praying for one particular thing, that God would send them help. And another American couple who has a long story of endurance, of going to a ministry and not having it work out in Italy the way they thought, coming back and working church playing in the States, and all this while wondering, God, why did you have us there, are now back in Italy serving them. So we, we spent a lot of time with Paul and Mackenzie Davidson, who were just great Sherpas for us. I mean, they walked us all through Salerno and, and taught us a lot more about the city and introduced us to all the folks who were leading there. And then Paul, while we were in his apartment, asked me a question that left us talking for about two hours and going through about eight pages of writing because I, I, I think better when I'm drawing pictures and it just works that way. Uh, he asked me this question. What would you train leaders to know and do before they went out and planted churches? At this point, and Diana's ready to just go have a meal with the wife because she's realized this is going to take a while. You've asked Ed the question that he's been dying to be asked by everybody. So I started to break through some of these things and realized they're everything that we've tried to do and be and give to the folks at Terra Nova. So let me walk through these most important pieces very briefly in our last minutes together this Sunday. I would start by saying the most important and obvious things, that Jesus is the center of Christianity. He's the big E on the I chart. If we take any other line, we're ignoring the big E. If we make it about church, if we make it about service, these are only consequential to knowing and loving and serving Jesus. 
Colossians 1, 15 through 22 says, He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Teach them Jesus, the imago. That just like an an icon, which is what that word is on a computer, it's just a symbol for something more behind it, all the code of an application behind an icon, all the depth of God behind the image of Jesus. That he's the creator who's made all things, they're his possession, that he provides for all things, they hold together in him, and that they're created for his purposes that we begin a new identity as a body, that we recognize in him we're held together by his headship. Uh, The Bible's very clear to teach the church in, in Trinitarian relationship. Under God, we are brothers and sisters of a common father. We we have this community together. Under the spirit, we're called a temple, pressed together brick by brick for our own holiness. And under the headship of Jesus, we become a body on mission. We who were enemies with God, saved only by the blood of Jesus on the cross. I would say we need to be men and women who know the incarnation. That John 1.14 says that he dwelt among us and was full of grace and truth, that it's presence that is the platform for every missionary to be able to know what truth to share and how to share it gently and reverently and to know what grace to give and where it needs to be applied. Presence is the great platform and stage for any missionary, whether you're at work, where you live, or where you would travel to. The church grows men and women who come to know, love, and serve Jesus in order to be released out of the church to speak more about that. That would be the last thing I would tell them. Build a monastery that trains the brothers well like the monasteries of old, where we speak the same language, sing to our God, and are trained, but don't close the gates. Send them back out like missionaries, because if it works rightly, the best monks should become the best missionaries. The one who study and serve God and worship him should have a love like his heart for others. And the best missionary should desire that other people grow into the church. Italy loves beauty. That's what I've realized after five trips there. They love it, for better or for worse. It's a cultural marker. They love it in their food and presentation clothing, including this lovely Salerno blazer. Uh Uh, But they they love beauty so much that it's become almost the eclipsing idol of the culture. And I think they miss the most beautiful thing they could ever see. When the bride of Christ lives the life of Christ and is willing to suffer and sacrifice because of the love of God poured out in our hearts for others, there is a beauty that is hard to even look at sometimes. They're sent like missionaries. Some will pour out, and you won't know them. The heroes of the kingdom of God, we won't know until the last day. Some will be noted for what they've done. Some of you, I hope, will go, or at least reconsider how you're going while you're staying here. What it means to be someone who's not just seeking God mystically and eternally, not just growing as a pilgrim internally, but is living as a missionary beyond themselves. I'm going to post some of the prayer requests that people gave us to write down, and I told them that I would share it. You'll, you'll see them on the city, uh, and, and I hope you will continue to pray for these churches and these missionaries in Serenissima and Salerno. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your calling. Thank you, God, that even in that 28th chapter of Acts, you had believers who were ready and waiting. And thank you, God, that there is a continued 29th chapter for our lives. We who stand where you've called us, who head where you desire us to be, given opportunities daily to enjoy and know you, to be changed and fulfilled in you, Lord. Oh, Lord, give us the opportunities and help us to have the grace and courage to intentionally take them to be able to share Jesus with others so that joy would expand, Lord. We ask, God, that you would even be calling and purifying us as a church who would be good missionaries, Lord. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.